touch me at all. You need to look at the screen and, and look at some pictures. There's going to be about 35 pictures that I'm going to run in series and hopefully uh, provide you some context of what um, uh, you're, you're looking at. But thank you for coming to Ashwita's. We have been... Pardon me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me on the camera? Okay, super. So, um, we have been closed for the better half of two years, uh, thanks to the pandemic and all that, and uh, the government officially announced yesterday that from March 31st, there is no COVID. So, um, we've been encouraging people to walk into the gallery. We started our first uh, exhibition after a very long break. This is the first show we've done uh, in two years. and. The works you're looking at here, and in case uh, some of you haven't come for the opening or ha haven't been here in the course of the last week and a half, this exhibition um, that's mounted currently and on all the walls is called Madras Aesthetics, and the subtext of the whole show is Trends from the Progressive Artists Association. Um, it is a very loaded title, so it's Madras Aesthetics because we're trying to bridge the gap between arts and crafts. And, and unlike the other schools of art in this country, Madras has been very heavy on arts and crafts. And of course, the modern art movement uh, in this city was also reliant on arts and crafts. And you describe crafts with aesthetics. You don't say that's a very aesthetic painting of Mokaya, but you do say that's a very aesthetically done vase or aesthetically done space or, you know. So um, that's why the title, it's a, it's a um, you know, we're trying to be creative with the concept, but uh, very clearly it's called trends because it's based off of art trends and art trends is, um, for lack of a better um, theory, it is the kind of Bible of Madras modern art, right? Because of anything that happened in this city from the late 50s all the way till the end of the 70s, early 80s has been kind of documented in that uh, magazine. It's, it's multiple volumes. Um, it, it ran in the 60s, there was a gap, and then it ran again a little bit in the 70s. Uh, but it documents modern art in this city. So to give context to what we are seeing here and what we have exhibited and curated, with, I thought I would do uh, a series of three talks, because if I did all this whole thing in one shot, all of you will definitely be asleep, or it'll have to be a three, three hour long lecture, because um, I speak a lot, but also because there is that much content in there. Um, so what I am trying to do today is to provide a historic context to the geographic region of what we consider Madras, because Madras didn't exist, right? Uh, essentially, Madras was, um, wrong button, this, right? Uh, if you want to go back in time, I'm not talking about 20,000 years ago, I'm talking about three, 400 years ago, this is what it was, a lot of sand and a lot of beach, and there was nothing here pretty much in this part of town. However, there has been an art history, there has been, uh, not art history in the uh, European academic sense, but there has been a, a long history of making, a long history of creating, and a long history of um, visual art, right? So, um, phones can ring, but just don't talk while I'm talking. But um, what happens in the art history that we learn today is that we only look at it with a European slant. I'm not using the very loaded word colonist or colonial slant because that's too much to unpack uh, in, in this context, but let's say it is a European academic uh, view of art, which is what we have all learned, which is what all the artists here who are exhibiting had learned, right? And which is what most people, and since this is a largely art-based audience, that is the theory that we are, um, basing our entire practice on, right? So how much ever identity and how much ever this truth we are searching for in our art practices as an art historian, as a curator, as practicing artists, as theoreticians, um, we are only working within a very strongly constructed European academic context. This is not me being against that, but I'm just giving you context. And what I'm going to be talking about is looking at that history from a very native indigenous, from our own perspective, looking at it from the point of view of what existed on the ground and how we will try and contextualize that into 
what these artists have painted, seen, drawn, and what is our collective consciousness to create that identity of what art in Madras is, right? And when I say Madras, please expand it. It's not, I don't mean Chennai, the city, which is why I'm not using the word Chennai in any of this uh, context. I am using the term Madras because Madras is both historic, you know, so from the time of British uh, occupation um, and wrong word there, not British occupation, European trade, okay, that's the correct historic word, and um, it is also the presidency which extends from large parts of Andhra Pradesh all the way down to Kanyakumari, all the way down to Travancore and, and uh, the Malabar uh, regions. So Madras was a large administrative district as well. And then of course today the city also is growing, uh, you know, where uh, at, at some point of time in Jambakam was not part of Madras district and now today it is part of Greater Chennai. In fact, it is very well within Chennai. So um, I'm going to start talking about, besides Madras, look, this is my view of Madras. I keep thinking this is what it will look like much before um, any, any of us came and settled. But to give you a geographic context, Let's keep Vishakapatnam, the Godavari and Krishna River as the northern border of influence. We stick to the coast. I am not going inland anywhere because since Madras is on the coast, since we are a, a coastal town, let's, you know, so start from um, the Godavari, Vishakapatnam, you come all the way down, uh, Nellore, Tirupati, then Chennai, of course, Pondicherry, and we cut off somewhere just above the Kaveri. Right? That is our immediate sphere or geographical region of influence. We're not going inland into uh, Tanjore, we're not going into uh, you know, places like Hampi and the, you know, uh, further in, we're not going up above uh, the Godavari, uh, we're definitely not going into Maharashtra with Ajanta and Elora, although these are terms and, and histories that are part of the national identity of art. Right? But I'm avoiding that to see how can we stick to what is, and not, not stick, but how do we arrive at understanding what art in this geographic region, uh, region was and how it has influenced people across time. Today's lecture is basically starting from ancient times. I'm not set a particular date, but let's say around the first, second century BC, uh, about 2100, 2200 years ago, all the way literally until the college was formed, which was 18. 50, right? I won't talk about what happens in the college. That's that's for next week if, if all of you do want to come. And now that you know it's on YouTube, you can skip it and watch it on YouTube. Um, so this is where we start. So I'm going to throw a lot of visuals at you. And do remember that these are the visual artistic engagements that has happened in this land, in this geographic area, right? It may sound alien, it may look different, it may not, you may not relate to it immediately, but this is the visual journey. This is our collective conscience coming together, right? So if you want to know how Perumal arrived at his folk looking figures or how Mukya engaged with the primitive forms, it starts here. So these are beads, they're carnelian beads, which are found um, in megalithic burial sites, right? The more famous ones are things like Kiradi, which we all talk about today in Madurai, but right outside Mahabalipuram, literally on one side you have all the uh, Pallava uh, uh, temples, the other side you do have megalithic burials, uh, all the way in Tirupurur, Sirdavur, and, and there are hundreds, and, and of course you don't have to go very far, uh, Chetpet was a very large burial site, Langdon Gardens, which we know as an area, they have found uh, things, uh, objects there, they sit at the Madras Museum today, Pallavaram, all these sites and locations, you would have, you find these beads. Um, and, and this is very primitive art, right? Because these were, uh, are believed to be individual markers of certain tribes or communities or groups of people. And they're not just designed, they do, they're not language, but they do communicate certain things. But the beauty is, these were not made here. These were all made in any guesses we keep it a little interactive so that all of you don't fall asleep. But um, any guesses on where you think these were made? They were used here. They were very much um, worn by people here in about 2,000 years ago. But where do you think these were made? Or where do you think they come from? Africa? No. Who said Persia? Persia, yes. So they do come from um, the other famous city in, in the uh, past. They, uh, largely parts of 
Persia, but they do come particularly from places around Damascus um, and such. But that's only the white color that you see. It's, it's the etching on the carnelian bead. But the carnelian beads themselves come from, it's closer, closer, not, it's in India. Any ideas, any clues? It's from the Narmada uh, Delta in Gujarat, where carnelian, it, it was the only place where carnelian is found on the surface. Why surface? Because we didn't have deep mining technology in those days. Today we can dig deep with uh, equipment, but in those days you had to find them on the ground. So think about it. There were people in Chetpet who were using these beads that they got made in Persia and the raw material came from Gujarat. So what was happening? Tons of things were happening. So clearly they would have had boring lectures at uh, you know their, their groups of people discussing the art of their times, I'm very sure. So. Um, we then move to things like this. By the way, a lot of what I'm showing you are at the Madras Museum. The Madras Museum is the most brilliant place for art history that nobody goes to. But this is a bronze um, sculpture. It is utilitarian. We don't know how exactly they used it. The base is a, is a pot and the top is like a cup. And then these are all, uh, we assume them to be buffaloes or, or, or some kind of a, a cattle. And these were found, this particular one was found in Adichanalur, um, closer to Madurai or, 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 or somewhere there. But um, bronze casting is not new to the region. It's not something that the Cholas and the Pallavas discovered one day. So this tradition would have come down. Um, you guys can Google it. I'm only talking basic Wikipedia level research. So if you do Google megalithic sites, if you do Google uh, additional lore um, or, or Alexander Rhea, you will find uh, these pictures and you'll find information on this. But basically, these are cultures and, and we broadly classify them as megalithic culture, but these are people who would have had cultural um, lineage from people you know of in the Stonehenge, right? So if you see, if you know Stonehenge, if you can visualize what it looks like in your head. It's the same people there and their practices that eventually over like three, 4,000 years moved all the way down to the bottom of South India, across Europe, across Asia, down from North India, down through Karnataka and then right to the bottom. Uh, where so, so the gap between this culture doing this and, 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 and Stonehenge is about 1,000, 1,500 years, right? So this was happening and, and this is part of our uh, visual uh, history. Look at this guy, you know, his reaction to my talk. But um, this is a terracotta sculpture, uh, very basic decoration. Uh, you know, now you see why Mukaya was doing the bulls he does or why a lot of artists, you know, not too, too different from Dhanapal's uh, works or, or what most people attempted to do as modern art. If you take this out of context, and I said this is modern art, this is modern art, but this is 2,000 years old. Um, and again, from this region. So you know that people were able to um, understand anatomy to a fairly good extent, you know. We, we are taught in, again, European uh, education teaches us that perspective was a discovery of Da Vinci and so on and so forth, and the Renaissance is what taught us how to paint with perspective. Obviously not. Um, uh, of course, they did discover a few things ahead of time than what we did, but clearly technology keeps going back and forth, practices keep going back and forth, influences come from outside this region into this region. We're all looking at the internet, looking at pictures of artists all over the world getting influenced. Similarly, they were also seeing things because it was not a very isolated world. There were trade routes, people were coming and going, um, they were traveling all over the India, all, I mean, of course it took them 20 days or 30 days to get to, uh, you know, uh, wherever they had to go to, but it actually wasn't that difficult a task. Ceramics and pottery, of course. Um, this is my, I, I keep comparing this to the Korean pottery. I don't know if you guys see uh, contemporary Korean moon pottery. This is white, beautiful piece of ceramic. And this is a white, is a black, uh, uh, you know, a piece of pottery that's at the Madras Museum. And it's just perfectly round. And it would have been used for burials or offering. Same like the Egyptians. Egyptians did it 3,000 years ago, where when they buried you, they would put all your things so that you have a good passage uh, to, to heaven or wherever. The same, same idea. So this is for your afterlife and they would bury you with various things and objects, uh, both of cultural significance as well as ritualistic significance. And, and they would bury you and, and, and hope you have a good life. But these are also the works of art that existed at that point of time. Think about it. You know, it's not easy to create a perfectly, 
you know, round uh, piece of pottery even today. So, at the same time, um, this is a new photo of new uh, uh, sculptural, uh, you know, um, pieces, but this is a practice that still exists from that period, right? So, again, European history says pagan, right? The word pagan, which is basically people who do not believe in a single god theory, right? So, pagans are people who believe in nature, people who believe in... Uh, in the fact that everything is spiritual, right? So a tree is sacred, a stone is sacred, the river, the water, the air, all that is sacred. So this practice still goes on, but it's a practice from that long ago. And I keep seeing, this is from Kanchipuram, and I looked at it and said, this is far better than any kind of conceptual sculpture or installation that you know people are attempting to make. But if you look at the influences, right? What we're doing today, look at Anish Kapoor, look at artists who are working with raw pigments. It's just this, you know, it's it, Anish Kapoor uses, uh, you know, red and uh, turmeric pigments. And, and, you know, he says it's from his Indian uh, lineage, but we've been doing this for 2000 years. It's it's in our life. It's, it's engaging with our day to day. We all walk by these things every day. But how many of us are looking at it and saying, this is art. It comes out of an artistic practice, right? So... Uh, what is art anyway, right? End of the day, it is a meditative practice that we all do in the privacy of our own studios, in the comfort of our own space, and to connect with something and to express and unload our thoughts and emotions. So, from there, we, we now travel a little forward in time. So now we're in, in 100 AD. Uh, this is a terrible photo of a beautiful place just outside of Pondicherry in a little village called Arikamedu. Now, why am I talking about Arikamedu? Why did I suddenly jump from uh, Chennai to Arikamedu? Because it's part of the coast, and again, you had those influences um, all the way up. Like, so it's it starts from Kerala. Kochi Muziris Benale gets half its name from the fact that Muziris was supposed to. It it, it was an ancient Roman port in the Indian coast, right? Because the Romans were trading all along the coast. They came across Africa, across uh, Persia, all the way you know, through Pakistan, Gujarat, down the coast to Kerala, up the coast, and then all the way to, um, not almost China, but most of Singapore and, and those kind of regions. And yes, the Romans were traveling. And there are, you know, there, it, when you look at uh, historic records, you'll find things saying there was a guy from Chennai who took a boat and went on a luxury cruise all the way to Indonesia and there were boats going back and forth and, and you would leave here during a particular season and you'd come back during another season because that's how the wind blew, right? So at Arikamedu, there was a a full full blown civilization or a full blown settlement over here where you would have seen Romans, you would have had, uh, you know, like uh, I suppose during the colonial era in those periods you would have had, you know, white people from Rome and Italy sitting here and doing business. They were all traders, right? What they were doing is they were sitting here and this is an excavation site uh, from, the, from the very late uh, uh, 1800s, but this is why they were here. I don't know if you can see amongst the sand, there is a blue bead and then there's a little black bead over there. If you go today also, you will find these at Arikamed. You can go any day after the rain and you can pick up beads. Don't pick up beads, but you can pick up beads. And um, this, is, this is what they were making in Arikamedu. And again, think about the process, right? All of us are also looking at the making of art, right? When, when we look at medium and material and so on and so forth, you have a bunch of people sit, and there were thousands of people sitting in Arikamedu. Today, it looks remote to us because it is uh, in the middle of nowhere. But in those days, it was a manufacturing hub. The statistic is from this period in time, which is about 100 and 200 AD, 99% of the beads discovered anywhere in the world, if you did an excavation anywhere in the world where you could find beads, they were made in this coast of Tamil Nadu, right? They all trace back to here. So think about the volume of trade and think about somebody developed a method to melt glass, to blow the glass, to extract the glass into these little strings and which have a hole in it and then to cut them, make them into beads. beads some cultures use them as currency. If you go today also to the islands of Sumatra, uh, if you go to Borneo, uh, like literally dowry is still in the form of these ancient beads. The older the trade beads, the more value it is. And, and if you're a bigger person, you'll have rarer beads. And it's still a, a very big sign of respect. Africa, yes. 
after the markets developed here and in Asia, the next market was all East Africa. So places like Mali, this is where eventually this technology from Tamil Nadu left and survived in, in East Africa, uh, Ethiopia, Mali, and places like that where they still are a heavy bead culture. Think about the impact for 2,000 years that one piece of technology and one piece of art making or a, a type of art making uh, has survived in this region. Today, I don't think there's any glass artist in this part of uh, the country. Then we travel a few years ahead in time, similar time. May, that was 150, 200 BC AD. This is about you know 180 to 250 AD. This is, again, um, the marbles from Amravati. Right? So as I said, Amravati is on the Godavari Krishna belt. It's south of that. And look at what they were doing. Again, 1,800 years ago, very high level of skill, very high level of perspective, composition. You know, there are people, you know, we talk about how, um, you know, the, the uh, older art doesn't have the kind of uh, nuances and perspectives and, and animation in them as they do today. But there are people whose back is towards, if you see the three ladies at the bottom, they're not facing the viewer. Right? When you look at Renaissance art, or when you look at uh, art from medieval Europe, they did not know how to compose like this, right? which is why, I'll tell you that story a little later, or we can do it at the Q&A, Rembrandt and, and, and miniatures and stuff. But um, So when you see this, this is very high level of art. It's coming from multiple regions in India. Like, I mean, today's India, in those days, whatever, many other countries. But the influence is coming from Greece. The influence is coming from Rome. The influence is coming from Persia. Craftsmen were coming from all over the place, right? We're talking about exchanging ideas today. Ideas were being exchanged in those days. Stories were being told. Because now this isn't just a work of art. It is also a narrative. Religion, ideas, faith was being created, right? You, we think of faith today as something that is so caught up in all our lives, so caught up and rigid, but in those days, that's the time they're making the story. That's the time that the story of Buddha is being illustrated for the first time and made popular, right? It's, so you could have actually edited the narrative at that point of time. It's like how you can edit the narrative with modern art today with your practices, and you can edit the future by what you're doing today. That's when they were editing. Uh, the religions that we think are old and ancient and rigid. But there's architecture going on. If you look at the top of this panel, that's, that's a model of the stupa and a kind of, a, a, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, one of their uh, uh, buildings that you would have found at Amravati itself. So very highly developed, no different from what we're doing today. This is the most spectacular pair of earrings. These were also made around that time. These were made in Antra. They sit at the Met Museum today. Um, again, very difficult to read. Uh, the iconography is very strong. If you look at the one on the left and look at the top, kind of looks like a namam, right? But it's also sitting in a, a kalasam with leaves on the other side. Uh, there's a lion here. So again, lots of symbols being made. But look at the craftsmanship. You couldn't get a jeweler today to make these pair of earrings. This is done with 24 karat gold. The beads are made. They're all soldered in place, you know. Um, and the quality of work, the, the, the geometry, imagine the mechanism they have figured out. It's only one hinge in the center, and it opens out. And, it and those days, yes, they had much longer ear lobes because even your ears were part of your day-to-day -day aesthetics. People didn't just have long earrings because they wanted to and not because of medicinal purposes alone, but it was part of the aesthetics. They thought that people looked very good when they had long ear lobes. And, and you can have long ear lobes, you can wear these, right? Um, this is again moving a little further in time where at the end of the Amaravati era, at the end of uh, Buddhist influence in India, which is about the fourth century, this is also found near Amaravati, bronze casting comes back into focus. So this is one of the, this is in the Madras Museum, possibly only one out of 10 known bronzes uh, cast of Buddha at that time, probably one of the only and known bronzes cast in South India at that time. So um, this is from about 300 to 400 uh, AD. And um, you can see you know, all the typical symbols of Buddha formed. And it's after this that the, the religion or the idea, the theology disappears, right? 
from this area. It comes back a little later in very unexpected uh, forms and sources, but um, so this is the kind of workmanship, this is the kind of work going on. And remember, this is probably the most precious work of art because getting bronze, using it and making something. So today, when you, when you want to relate this to the Dhanapal at the back, which is also a bronze, Dhanapal could do what he wanted to with his sculpture because bronze is not a highly rare commodity. It's like here, the bronze was used only to make an image of God. There, bronze is made to make an image of the artist's ego. Right or the artist's idea of what he thought that visual should be like. So to give you the context of rarity and material and how they used it, I think today we use paint left, right and center. And then we move a little closer to us. This is Mahabalipuram. Um, I, I, I can refer. So the reason why I'm showing this of all the many, many thousands of sculptures at Mahabalipuram, and this of course is coming down to the Pallava influence. So the Pallavas themselves have a very fascinating story. Their origins are not, as we all are taught, is not from uh, Tamil Nadu per se. They are a warring tribe. They are they were chieftains and generals of other armies in the Satavahana dynasty. Uh, but they also originally came from much further out, not even from India, and eventually settled here in, in the region of Kanchipuram. And when they were in Kanchipuram, they decided to start an art residency. I kid you not. I am seriously writing this theory. I, I believe that Mahabalipuram was an artist's residency. Uh, the way uh, we, you know, I, I run the Piramal Art Residency in Bombay. It's, it's very similar to that. Uh, there is enough evidence and proof and uh, no conspiracy theories. If, if you uh, see, the, and I'll try and explain that to you, why I think it's an art residency. Um, this is an image from the, not the Varaha cave, which is what everybody has seen and everybody has gone to, which you see Varaha standing there and carrying Bhuma Devi. And this is the Varaha temple, which is never opened. It's a practicing temple. It's been closed off. And I think they open it only once every like 15, 20 days. And if you're lucky, you can go there. It's behind uh, the, the set of monuments. It's, it's, uh, um, there is a, a lotus pond when you go towards what is called the Shell Museum and it's, it's somewhere there. And this is where you will find two incredible things. You will find the, the first picture you see on your left is a portrait of Simma Vishnu. Simma Vishnu is supposed to be the founder of the Pallava dynasty. He was the first establishing king of that dynasty. And you will also see opposite him his grandson, they assume it's his grandson, either Mahendra Varman or his great grandson, uh, Narasimha Varman, the second. But um, ideas are being created. So what you see here, you see a Gaja Lakshmi, right? You can see you can see a better version of it again in the more popular monument. But you can see Lakshmi sitting in the center. You have the two elephants, and as if they're pouring the water, and it's like a cycle. It's an animation, right? You can see the second elephant getting ready, and it's like cyclical. So kind of like a a static animation that you see. But that's the first time that this imagery is being created in this region. Right? Earlier, sim uh, you would find a little earlier than this, you, you, you would find references uh, in central India, in, in um, also uh, parts of the Gupta Empire, which was in and around Mathura and, and such places uh, in, in North India. And ideas from there do come down. The religion itself is coming down to this region. So the... Uh, the Pallavas started off, as I said, they were Buddhists, they were Jains, and then they converted to Shaivism, they were exploring that. They were converted to Vaishnavism, they were exploring that. The father could be Jain, the son would start off being Buddhist, and then convert to Shaivism, and then decide that he would be a Vaishnavite. So it's amazing how you could flow through ideas. These ideas are being created, right? It's like we talk about modern art being created, or, or what was... Panikar's contribution or what was Roy Chowdhury's con uh, contribution and how did they change things and arrive at modern art, these kings were sitting here and changing ideas and concepts and it was giving birth to visual uh, art, it was giving birth to sculpture, it was giving birth to architecture, it was giving birth to concepts that were divine, literally. Today, what all we know, I'm assuming that we are a very mixed um, uh, spiritual ba uh, uh, group here, but a lot of the ideas that you know start here, right? They come here, they come from here. Um, so anyway, so then there's, of course, uh, 
we all know mahishasura mardini where she is killing the uh, mahisha uh, mahishasura the son of a buffalo demon that's literally his name uh, translated but that's mahishasura mardini before she kills mahisha so she's just durga there um anyway long story short so this is why i think all of mahabalipuram was an art residency every single monument in mahabalipuram is left incomplete right so one theory is that there was a single day event single day event was it came, uh, there was a natural disaster that came and wiped everything out possibly a tsunami possibly the fact that the king died and the next guy said no 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 i'm not spending money on this like you know aidmk goes dmk comes bjp goes whatever so propaganda stops idea stop it's as simple as that it's not complicated you don't have to think of some mega tsunami that came and wiped out no it could have been as simple as the king said sorry sir and these two um you know are are rarer examples in mahabalipuram these are again at the back of mahabalipuram towards pondicherry um i'm blanking out on all their names but these two rathas were carved top bottom that is the greatest architectural contribution of the pallava empire until that point and think about this they did not know how to build temples that did not burn down they were building temples out of wood and thatch and their temples their sacred spaces would constantly catch fire because there's no electricity they were lighting lamps all day long and everything caught fire so around 550 ad mr mahendra varman the first said i have had it and i need to figure out how to build something that's fireproof and this is how they started this is where they experimented and they also said okay how do we look at a giant rock and how do we carve it like do i start from the bottom do i start from the top how do we you know construct this how do we conceive this obviously they had great architects and sculptors who worked together thought about it they carved top bottom right so as you finish the sculpture you don't have to worry about something falling on it and breaking it so when you come top bottom you're finishing it and coming down and obviously they all stopped you know so that we could theorize why they stopped carving all the boulders that you see would have been bits and pieces of what they cut off but all of mahabalipuram is like this there are indications on every you can't find a non um you know halfway stopped monument in mahabalipuram right so theory is they were using mahabalipuram as a practicing ground for do you know where there is complete pallava architecture i have repeated that many times kanchipuram right so kanchipuram is the full intact perfect fully done beautiful city it's exactly one straight line from mahabalipuram and um again artists apparently like to go to camps in nice places so mahabalipuram would have been a nice beach they would have had you know fishing and surfing and uh you know sitting on the shack and drinking and then coming here and doing incomplete artwork so would i get into trouble if i say camp works are not the best but um anyway so yeah so they were doing this so this is this is uh, artistic practice and engagement in this region right so this is what was happening this is what people were doing and um of course this is the uh today we call them the five ratas this is probably the most complete but this is also incomplete because they figured out saying okay let's work on the roof let's practice on how to make the roof let's figure out what sculpture works well because each one is a different architectural uh design on which every temple in south india is based on it's based off of these concepts like for example uh if you see the semi circle the second ratha which is the semi circular one it is uh called the gaja prishta which is the bum of an elephant and that's the shape elephants were extremely important symbols in india because they were the most powerful animals they were the symbols of the satavahanas the pallavas the chola everybody i mean it was undisputed and and so the temple was shaped that way so that is the uh, gaja prishta which is literally the elephants you know if you know what an elephant looks like then they figured out something the second one it's still incomplete but they figured out okay let's try using a stupa the you know a, a buddhist architecture influences and then they came up with their own um what we now know as the the blueprint for the gobaram there and since that was what they i think i assume they liked they went and put portraits and titles of all the kings the on four corners are portraits of the pallava kings and their names are written on top of it right uh all kinds of fascinating titles were given including my most favorite pallava title for a king uh, is vabu which is 
translates to today is when we say vambu, you know, in Tamil, and we say vambu as gossip, and we say vambu as, you know, it's a negative connotation, but in those days it meant news, and it meant the king would get information before all of you, so that was his title. So they gave him the title as vabu or, or vambu, which, uh, you know, it, it's funny how a, a, a title of a king becomes a negative word uh, 1,500 years later. Then, this is the same thing you saw, but the reason I'm showing you this is because, thanks to the Government College of Arts and Crafts, we now have um, slightly older visual records of what is happening. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the photo and their backgrounds, but it, it gives you a slightly different look on what was happening uh, to further my theory of being a residency, because today the Mahavalipuram we know, or all of you know, is after a lot of um, restoration and reconstruction over the last 150 years. But this was 150 years ago. If you notice, that central part has fallen down. The sand has filled up almost today. It's about seven to eight feet uh, of sand, right? So which is the theory why people thought that the sea came in or sand? How do you move that volume of sand across Mahabalipuram unless you've had a tsunami coming in and uh, doing things? Uh, and, and leading to abandonment of the site, so which is why there are uh, multiple theories. But there's a guy standing there to give you perspective of how big um, the monuments are, and you know it's fully overgrown, and uh, it's also what uh, the coast of Madras would look like if it wasn't populated. More pictures. Uh, you can see the growth around it, the sand covering the entire base of um, this site. This is any guesses? I mean, it's not that tough, but okay. This is Tiger's Cave. So um, you know how much, you can see, barely see a tiger's face there, but this is how much sand was covered um, at Tiger's Cave and, and, and possibly why nobody ever discovered it for so long uh, until some white guy with a lot of time on his hands. No offense to Vivian sitting in the crowd. But, um, you know, so till they came and, and, and kind of excavated and start. Actually, the reason why they did excavate is on this big tall stone that you see and you look like there's like a slot on top, there is an inscription. And that's what gave curiosity to say what's below this. If it wasn't for the inscription there, um, they wouldn't have excavated this whole site. So, now we're moving to the more complete Pallava city, which is Kanchipuram. And then we now come into about 650, 750 AD. Very close to where we are, very much part of our visual uh, history, our visual aesthetics. This is a lovely view of Kanchipuram town from the top of one of the, I'm assuming uh, Ekambreshwar temple or Vardaraj Parmal, the two bigger ones. You can see how beautiful they are. You can see that even here, what we see today as the mandabams inside the complex are still propped up with wooden poles and thatched roof, right? So they clearly were also catching fire even then. They clearly had to be renovated every 12 years, which is why you have, you know, your uh, Kumbhavishekams and you have, you know, your Brahmotsavams and so on and so forth. And the very reason that I'm showing this is to say, we see art very static today. We see them stuck in time. We see them stuck on this. This Mukaya will never ever change, right? As long as this painting exists, it will not change. But art in those days, all this art, all of this is art, it's all sculpted, it's all painted, would constantly change. Every patron would come and say, let's do this, let's add this, let's, you know, come in. So what did that mean? It means that every citizen, every person living in this region knew art. They knew the art around them. It's not as if like one king and one designer were walking around and saying, let's add this sculpture here, let me put this god here, let me paint this that color. It's happening today. Today, there's one priest and one temple board, and they say, let's go multicolor on this Gobaram. But in those days, the whole village, the town, they would have said, let's renovate it this way. Let's do this. Let's add that. So the general population probably had a far better understanding of the artistic practices and capacity of art around them than we do today. Otherwise, these temples would not stand for so long. They would not have built uh, both political, economic, you know, and social um, structures around this temple. Like today we say, okay, a gallery needs an, end, uh, a, a museum needs an endowment. You need a patron for, an artist needs a patron, right? So all these things were built in here and which is why they survived thousands of years. 
right? We, today we struggle to say, how do you support an artist? The biggest problem we've had uh, talking to a lot of people who started to come back into our galleries, we're saying, hey guys, we're a gallery, come and participate, listen to me talk, but you can't exhibit here. You know, unfortunately, you know, there's only so much patronage you can do when there's so many people, but temples were great ways of occupying thousands and thousands of artists. Temples, any, any kind of construction in those days which, which were heavily um, aesthetically inclined. So, in Kanchipuram, you start to see the revival of bronze as a medium. Right, and which is why it's very. Uh, I don't know if Dhanapal feels the weight of his practice, but I certainly am putting a lot of, uh, you know, uh, pressure on his bronzes. This is what was being again rediscovered, right here in Kanchipuram. They were again figuring out this metal, and this is not bronze, by the way. It's called. It's actually an alloy, and some people call it potin. If you actually drop it, it'll shatter. There's a heavy content of tin in it. They were discovering, and 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 the point was, if you melt this, you can't use this metal back to make something. Isn't that such a phenomenal concept? Like, if if your sculpture is going to be destroyed or repurposed, you can't make another sculpture with it. It's, it's, you know, you develop an alloy in such a way that it can't be, you know, uh, not counterfeited, but cannot be used. The artist said, hey, you know, this is my pile of terracotta, this is my pile of uh, clay, and this is my pile of uh, uh, metal. So they start to explore the form, aesthetic changes, look at their ideal structure of a woman and a man. Of course, it's a, a goddess and, and Vishnu, but the idea of what a woman looks like, right? Now look at... Mr. Perumal's paintings. Don't they look very similar? Um, you know, so, so this, who is to say Perumal didn't look at things like this? Who is to say, uh, I keep pulling on Perumal, but Santan Raj or uh, Vardarajan or any of these lovely gentlemen here. Uh, so these are part of our visual aesthetics that were being developed. It reflected on fashion. It reflected on jewelry. It reflected on how somebody would see themselves as a god, right? Because here you're now saying, and think about society. Today, yes, we talk about autocratic leaders. Today we're all talking about Putin and what is one man doing to wreck the world. But here you had one king who said, I am God, respect me. So how should that king look? How should, so these, they also say were portraits of people, right? They, it, would, it would try to resemble your king in the form of God. So you're going to a temple, but please be aware that this is the temple the king built for you. The king is the god that you have to worship. And through the king is how you access God. So there's so many things going in. So imagine the brief meeting that this artist would have had sitting there. I'm sure whoever, you know, from Nandi Verman downwards would have been sitting there with this. I'm sure he would have inspected it. It wouldn't have been like, here, sir, please, is one ponade and one sculpture. They, he would have discussed what was going on here. Again, uh, it is the rarest of the rare. You know, even today, I mean, the biggest of the big patrons sit with artists and, you know, if there's a commission, they sit there and discuss and talk and, you know, uh, anyway, architecture. This is uh, my most favorite uh, piece of architecture in Kanchipuram. Uh, this is the Vaikuntha Perumal Temple. It is the most mind-blowing concept. I mean, if artists could make you think so this temple is, is, is kind of a time machine come uh, the origins of uh, Vaishnava belief. It, it encapsulates the entire universe in it. It's a temple that has been built and allow me to give you this concept because this architect is able to tell, allow me to tell you guys a story. So it's the same responsibility that I believe artists should have when they make artwork. How do I tell your story with your artwork? So the story goes, this is a square temple and the gobaram goes up, right? So when you are walking in and you walk in through the east side as opposed to the west in most temples, according to this theory, you are walking from darkness into light. Vaikuntha Perumal is light and you walk from darkness that is the side of darkness in the scriptures in your uh, yeah, I, I won't get too much into it but in your Vaishnavite scriptures there is a side for light there is a side for darkness so you walk from darkness into light so you enter the temple that way right Asatoma and so on and so forth and when you look at the temple from above you will see four concentric boxes when you look at it from below, you see something rising to the sky. 
there is right on top Vishnu is as Krishna below him is Vishnu reclining below him is Vishnu seated so you see all three forms of Vishnu and the whole idea is that Vishnu is also everything and Vishnu is also within so the temple is built to express that concept to say that if you look at him from above everything is within right because they're concentric squares but if you look from below everything is there and that's the universe it's fascinating there's a whole book written about it um, you guys can read it and and if I have more patience I will do a talk just on the temple um, but and then of course if you measure the temple from this corner to its diagonal opposite corner that's how you calculate time in the context of asuras their time is different from men us if ours is 24 hours a day they will I think one day for them is 2000 years or something like that but if you actually measure it you can measure time like that so if you measure from this side to that side is the time of devas if you measure from the top to the bottom is the time of insects it's unbelievable how they have theorized so many concepts into what we think is a temple but it's also a work of art it's also a work of architecture uh, hundreds and thousands of people could have worked on it and um, there is so much packed into it and hence it survives for so long not the fact that it's just made of stone but the fact that there is so much theory and story and intrigue and it keeps giving you things right the fundamental fact of all artwork and I'm sounding very preachy is that it has to keep giving you things that's why when we go and go to a museum abroad and we look at a Van Gogh and we're like oh my god this is a spiritual experience it keeps giving you things it keeps you keep engaging with it you keep looking at it and you keep having different experiences every time you see a good work of art this of course is uh, from the Kailas and other temples my most favorite Ganesha and friends uh, so this is a tiny border tiny little border at the bottom uh, of the entire temple where you see these little gargoyle like figures um, from from 700 AD and and Ganesha Ganesha so Ganesha today has been elevated to a much larger God but in that time Ganesha was the little demon gods they were the uh, they were the they were the they were not the Asuras but the uh, they were the you know little bratty uh, gargoyles and demons and, and he was part of that they were the uh, good luck charms and, and so on and so forth so each one of them then has an origin theory uh, and then they become major gods and minor gods but you can see they're all having fun they're dancing and this is a tiny border which if you actually zoom out and if you visit there you'll see you'll be like oh this looks very Chinese you know uh, and the artistic influence which was true it could have been from there because it's this uh, uh, dynasty that actually then um, gives rise to all your Bora Badur and, and uh, uh, everything that you see in Cambodia and uh, other places that we visit um, the influences from here now I'm going to skip right past the Cholas uh, no, it's not that the Cholas had uh, uh, no influence uh, on this region but the Cholas do not actually have any major contribution or artistic origins from this region the region that I mentioned along the coast they are predominantly uh, inland they're predominantly in the southern parts of Tamil Nadu more Tanjore uh, and, and so on and so forth so I do not bring them in but yes over time you know these dynasties became bigger and bigger the Pallavas were smaller the Cholas were a little bigger the Vijayanagar was even bigger the Nayaks were even bigger and then eventually you know they became uh, all Tamil Nadu and then South India and so on but uh, I'm going to skip right past the Cholas not that they don't have any artistic contribution but because they don't have any artistic contribution to our uh, particular geographical region so I will skip right past by about 300 years and arrive at what is the Vijayanagar Empire and the Vijayanagar Empire is very interesting because they are very large they start somewhere around you know 1300s and they start consolidating primarily because of a lot of uh, Hindu kings kingdoms and, and, and areas but they also start to become so wealthy that kings like Krishna Devaraya had so much money that he was supporting something like 4,000 temples can you imagine one guy patronizing 4,000 artists um, you know and, and temples and so on uh, and and they were pushing the boundaries for sculpture they were pushing the boundaries for painting they were pushing the boundaries for architecture there isn't a temple in South India whether it's Karnataka Andhra Tamil Nadu Kerala that has not been renovated by the Vijayanagar Kings and you will see this kind of artwork everywhere and 
this is the more recent in living memory kind of uh, ima images that we see that affects art practices in this city, right? Uh, this is where you will, when we say traditional art, it starts here. When you look at artists like Srinivasalu, when you look at artists, uh, you know, who, who think they're painting um, what is the more traditional form of art, it starts from the Vijayanagar influence. Um, this is not a picture of a fan. You look at behind the fan uh, is a fully painted house in Kanchipuram, but done in the Nayak period, maybe around, uh, would have been built in the 1800s, but the painting style and the influence, what happens in the Vijayanagar period also is that you have a lot of Europeans starting to come in. And when I say Europeans, I mean Europeans who have come for trade, who have come for business, who have come for seeing India, you know, uh, it became a very uh, easily accessible country. You had the Portuguese, you had the Dutch, you had the French coming in, you had the English coming in, you had Germans working for these guys, you had the Swiss working for these guys. It was a big mishmash. And then of course you had all the Chinese, the Indonesians, the, the Malays, all of them coming here. And um, all kinds of things start to happen, buildings start to look very European. Uh, the entire Maratha kingdom, I'm not covering them here because there was no Maratha influence on this coast, uh, but you know, they were employing French architects in the 1700s and saying, build my palace. You can go to uh, Kumbhakonam Tanjavur today and you can walk into bungalows that were built by French architects. You will find all the French symbolism uh, over there. A lot of things. I don't know how many of you, next time you walk around anywhere, if you look at compound wall gates, you will see the floor release everywhere, everywhere in South India. It's, it's the leaf with the triangle uh, and, and, huh? Like, like a dagger with two things. So that's the French floor release. Um, and, and it's, it became so popular that it's everywhere in our culture even today. And, um, this, of course, you will find in most temples. This is the kind of painting that they were doing. Again, they became entertaining, right? So the art started, I think the picture is upside down, sorry. Um, art started to become not just visual to see and go, but also to pass on messages, to tell stories. Now the religions, remember, are a thousand years old. So you need to tell the entire Ramayana, the entire Mahabharata, the entire whatever, and then plug the king in there somehow and tell his story uh, in parallel. Uh, you know, so, and then talk about the culture, show what is happening in your city. Think about it. This is the equivalent of your digital banners in a mall that you walk up to. You walk into Satyam Sinvas and you see these flashy posters. This is the equivalent of that. It, we see it in its historic context today. We see it as old and antique, but a brand new, there would have been people saying, oh my God, what is this terrible artwork on the ceiling, right? But um, that's exactly what it is. And of course, we then come into a wonderful period which is very badly researched in our history. We don't know about this. The Europeans know all about it because from the 1600s, when you had Pulikat being set up for the Dutch, when you had Tranquibar being set up for the Danish, when you had Santom for the Portuguese, you had Fort St. George and, and Fort St. David and uh, uh, Vishak Patnam and Machli Patnam for the British and am I leaving anybody else out? No. So um, they started to, they all came here to trade, right? The, the Europeans came here, wherever they went in the world, for trade. Europe is a very tiny piece of land. Most of it is landlocked, cold half the year, nothing grows there. And everything the world needs is from the Indian Peninsula, from the Malay and Indonesian peninsulas and islands and south of Africa and a lot of it from South America. So that's why all these Europeans start to go out from the very late 1500s and they arrive here and they're like, wow, you have cotton and you have you know, peacocks and you have all these wonderfully rich cultures and you have inherent artisans, you have, you know, so, so these are Kalamkaris, right? They're absolutely impossible to find in India, in museums, because India is the enemy of art. Not, not politically, but materially, uh, cloth will just degrade. It doesn't survive uh, as, as, as a quote from um, a very popular uh, James Woods who's a historian. He says, in India, you can throw a mango seed and a mango tree will come, right? That's how fertile we are. That's how humid and hot and, and nothing survives. Paintings don't survive, um, you know, so textiles do not survive. 
and therefore they all degrade but in Europe they survive very well right so this is a beautiful textile it's a kalamkari which shows you know there are all kinds of instruments there are two geese in the corner there's a guy playing you know a violin and a fiddle and there's you know and they're all very european looking people there are mughal looking people they're persian looking people so basically this is you know selling india to the west and this is why they came here and this is why the east india company made so much money right they started moving these kalamkaris from places like uh, kalahasti and 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 your entire coast around tirupati from madras like the reasons Mylapur had a weaving center, uh, Chintadri Pet was a weaving center, Fort St. George had, they moved weavers from Kanchipuram here. They had factories, you know, um, and, and factories just to s make these things. So this was a very popular art form, which is why Europeans came here. Al along with this, there were a few other things, but they were more practical. So this is something that's moved out of our uh, knowledge and our visual history. But yeah, they're, they're spectacular works of art. This is what we now consume. So it's a full circle. Now you go to Anoki and buy all this stuff. But this is what we were actually trading from here. And, and then it went a full circle. This is, this is the Victoria and Albert Museum's uh, bed set. So they came here. They took all our chintz, traded, made lots of money, built an empire, gave us independence, and we buy their bed quills now. Um, but this is the art form that, unfortunately, uh, has moved uh, more to Jaipur and Rajasthan, where we think Anoki and all that stuff and Fab India comes from there, but uh, the original uh, origins of it was here. And then, of course, um, everything takes a turn. So indigenous art starts to become not so popular. Patronage has moved, right? Patronage is no longer, the money is no longer, you follow the money. In art, you always follow the money, right? So um, the money is no longer in the hands of the locals. It's in the hands of the Europeans. So what happens? India is exotic now, right? The same reason why you have Goa and you have wherever else, uh, uh, Rishikesh and whatever, is because people wanted to come here Artists wanted to come here. It's all artist-based. Artists are the ones who first come here and land up in Auroville and, and whatever. And um, so, so these were traveling artists. So what they would do is they would join the East India Company and they would get on their ships for a free ride all the way down to Madras. And they would say, okay, now let me find work as a portrait painter. And they were talented. These guys were all Royal Academy graduates. And they would come here. And of course, this is Mr. Muhammad Ali Walaja, a famous portrait of his from uh, the 1770s by uh, Tilly Kettle. And Tilly Kettle became a very big influence. And this is, now you can start to see why things are looking like Ravi Verma and so on and so forth. These guys brought this visual here, right? And they started to bring in these kind of persons, show the clouds, show the sky terrible picture I'm seeing you can go online and search for it. you'll find it you know painting coconut trees bringing in the curtains now the curtains are European yes but by that time having these pillars and long curtains were part of Madras architecture and style and design their velvets were coming in from Europe we were buying them and we were using them and definitely uh, the Nawab of Karnatic would have had uh, only European fittings in his house, right? It's like you, all the, you want to buy imported chandeliers and imported beds and imported things today, same thing. They were also rolling around in French beds and uh, British made furniture and, and German made wardrobes and Italian marble in your, think about it, it, it it's, you know, it, it, it's not f fiction. Then of course you have um, a little later in the 1790s, you have uh, Thomas and William Daniel and they start to come and paint oil paintings, they start to portray landscapes. Now, we went from, you know, um, the idea of uh, indigenously designed art to now what is a European translation of what art looks like here. Uh, this particular painting, just a side note, uh, was painted the day that Tipu Sultan was captured. Uh, and the artists were told to camp out here on the way because the soldiers were coming back from the battle and they didn't want to, it's small roads, you know, no two-way access. This is the Mysore-Bangalore highway somewhere. Um, and, you know, so they just figured that this is what they saw and they painted it. But this is now what the population wanted. Everybody in India wanted these paintings. The, the people who would collect art or people who could afford art wanted this. And eventually, and this is where the story is going to end, um, you had people coming in. But in around 1810, 1820, this gentleman, his name is... George Chinneri or Chinneri. He was a British artist who left, landed up in Madras for a few years. But what he did 
was he taught a few uh, people, few, you know, again, British residents, how to print, how to make lithographs, and how to paint. So he was the original Alexander Hunter, right? So he didn't set up an institution, but he taught a few more famous people, people like uh, John Gantz and his son Justinian Gantz, and he helped them set up their press. And John and Justinian Gantz went nuts. I mean, those guys printed more prints than anybody else. They published books, so they were in Broadway, and they're the guys who first kind of created this colonial idea of what India looks like. Although Thomas and William Daniel did that for all of India, these guys do it for all of Madras. So you'll find lots of these representations of Fort St. George, Government House. This is somewhere near Government Estate in Gindi, I think, or maybe Rajaji Hall, somewhere there. Um, you know, and, and this was all being sent out. Again, these are not being consumed by people here. But this is how, think about, we, we went now, started to kind of go down that slippery slope where all the traditional art and craft, all the indigenous art and craft, all the 2,000 years worth of uh, art, artistic practice, knowledge, uh, and, and, and um, you know, uh, history was starting to slip. And then eventually, we kind of find ourselves here. I'm not going to talk about this picture, but this is where all the art in Madras finally finds itself in the 1850s in an exhibition that takes place in London. But my talk on Tuesday is going to be about how a gentleman from Madras decided a, almost a year before this exhibition happened to start the college and how he then goes back and says, let me dig through the past to figure out what was happening here. All the stuff that I spoke about, how am I gonna get all of this into one institution? And his, his genuine intention was, how do I take what has dwindled and become very bad into the best quality product, the best thing that people can see because all of the talent is here. How do we pick it up, make it modern? He was using the word modern then um, and he, he continues to, um, you know, be the largest modern contributors to art and culture in India. But this is the uh, what I'm going to be talking about next week. And yeah, so the, hopefully you've had a, a, a good visual understanding of what kind of art existed in Madras, of what kind of, uh, if all of you are native to this place, or what is your, you know, ancestral visual history, right? What is what is in us, what is subconsciously in us, how do we connect to what we are seeing, and how do you relate to what we call modern art, and how do we contextualize it in um, today's very global world, right? Because we all genuinely are grappling with the ideas of why don't Madras artists get a chance? Why is Madras not seen in, on, even in the national front? Why is it such a struggle for artists from Madras to uh, go and exhibit somewhere, so on and so forth? Hopefully we'll unravel, explain and discuss these things over the next two talks. And uh, yeah, so thank you all for being here. This is what's going to be happening uh, next two weeks. One is next Tuesday and the Tuesday after that. Um, and yeah, so this is uh, a rough summary if you can understand it. But thank you for being here. And uh, if you guys have questions, I'm happy to answer. And there's more tea and coffee and juice. And thank you.